and welcome to Emmanuel Baptist Church. We are very, very glad you have joined us, and the Lord is here, and we are here to worship Him and enjoy Him. Let's take our Bibles as we begin today to John 4 and verse 46. I'd like to begin reading at verse 46 and read down through John 4, 54. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. There was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Galilee, out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said to him, Except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The nobleman said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go your way, your son lives. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, says, Your son lives. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. And they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew it was at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son lives, and himself believed, and his entire house. This is again the second miracle that Jesus did. Good morning again. Uh, please open your hymnal on hymn 147. And we'll continue to enjoy the reality of all these verses. Stand up, please.
chapter 12. I'd like to begin at verse 10. And just a reminder to, as carefully as we can, pay attention to the punctuation. It's not always easy, but we'll try to get a reading that we're all on the same word. Let's try it together. Remember the scripture reference first and last, shall we? Romans 12, 10 through 13. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality, Romans 12, 10 through 13. Please remain standing. Uh, and open your hymnal to 169. Rejoice ye your own heart. We'll sing it in gladness. An interesting book was written some time ago, I think it was around the year 2001, by a woman by the name of Riata Strickland, IT specialist, graphics designer, professor, mother, and Sunday school teacher from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. The book she wrote, An Interview with God. In the interview, God is asked the following question. What is the most interesting and surprising thing you find in humans? His answer, the fact that they get bored of childhood, then they crave to be children again. 
They waste their health making money and afterwards spend money to regain health. The fact that they ponder over the future with fear and forget the present. They live their lives like they will never die and they, and they really have never lived. In one or two words, Mrs. Strickland was attempting to describe what happens in your heart when you have misplaced priorities. And of course, God sees your heart. So today I want to, I want to turn your attention to somebody who had rearranged the priorities. And because of it, because of it, his life and the life of someone quite close to him completely changed. So I've titled today's message, Simple Faith. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for the simple things. There are so many simple things, Lord, and we have too many complicated things, Lord. But thank you for the simple ones, Lord. Thank you for the Bible stories. Thank you, Lord. We know the Bible stories are true. We thank you that you wrote them down for our benefit. We thank you, Lord, that we're living in a complicated world with all our technology and activity, Lord, and it's only led us to more fear and more worry. And so I want to say thank you for the simple things, and I want to ask today, Lord, to help us to find the simple things. Lord, we know that your word is wonderful. We don't want to make it complicated, Lord. I ask for your spirit to direct our way this morning. I just thank you that you wrote these words down. So that, Father, you said the simple ones, the children, are the ones that have a true walk with you. And I pray, Lord, you'd help us to be among the simple ones. As we look at your word, as we listen to your word, Lord, as we learn what your ways are like, help us, Lord, today, I pray that you'll cause us in our hearts to see the simplicity of Christ, in whose name I pray, amen. Would you take a Bible with me and find Matthew chapter 8? Today I want to begin with distance, D-I-S-T-A-N-C-E, distance. How far is it from Old Saybrook to New London? The distance from Old Saybrook to New London is 18 miles. That is not remarkable, unless you consider the following. I would guess that every one of you know of the first miracle of Jesus. First miracle at a wedding, first miracle is that Jesus turned water into wine in a town called Cana in Galilee. I want to talk about a town that is just 17 miles away from Cana. I want to talk about something that took place in the town called Capernaum. I don't want to confuse you, but I want you to see a map I want you to think with me that for the Jewish people in the first century, the second most important, we'll say, city or town next to Jerusalem was the city of Capernaum. It means the village of Nahum, listen closely, nine of the Lord's miracles took place in the town of Capernaum. This is the second miracle. This is the second miracle. Jesus came again to the Cana of Galilee where he had made the water wine. There was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. What's the distance? From Cana to Capernaum is 17 miles. 
When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and he besought him that he would come down and heal his son because he was at the point of death. And Jesus said to him, except you see signs and wonders, you won't believe. The nobleman said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, go your way, your son lives. And the man believed the word that God had spoken unto him. And he went his way. And as he was going down, his servants met him. And they told him, saying, your son lives. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lived and believed, and his whole house. This, again, is the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. So what happened? What happened? The distance, I said, was 17 miles. The father came to Cana, and the father said, my son in Capernaum, 17 miles away, is almost dead. Come and heal my son. That's what it says. Jesus then turns and he says what? I'm going to come. On the way, the Bible says, the man having believed, his servants came to him and he said, your son is alive. When did that happen? It happened at the exact time in Cana, when the boy was healed over in Capernaum. Now, I don't want to confuse you, but I want you to think with me about the simple fact of the second miracle that Jesus performed was in the town of Capernaum. Now, I want you to find with me Matthew 8 for another miracle. Look at Matthew chapter 8 and find with me the fifth verse, please. The Bible says in verse 5, Jesus entered into Capernaum, there it is, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him, saying, Lord, my servant lies at home, sick, paralyzed, grievously tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. When Jesus, the centurion answered, he said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. Speak the word only and my servant will be healed. For I'm a man under authority, having soldiers unto me. I say to this man, go, he goes to another. Come, he comes to my servant, do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard it, he marveled, and he said to them that were following, verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many will come from the east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, in the kingdom of heaven. And the children of the kingdom will be cast out in outer darkness and be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said to the centurion, go your way as you have believed, so be it unto you. And his servant was healed the self-same hour. A couple things. I'd like you to think I like you to think carefully. I like you to see what the I like you to see what the events are. I like you to see what the story really is. But I want you to always look at two things. One, God, and two, the people. So here's the story. It's a really great story. So I want to make mention of the fact that there are lots of miracles. And we've talked a bit about the miracles. And I want you to consider with me my question. Don't you just love the miracle stories in the Bible? Or am I the only one that loves these stories? I just am totally beyond blessed when I consider these miracle stories because if you didn't have the miracle stories, you wouldn't have a Bible. It's full of miracle stories. And we've talked about miracles and what they really are. But Capernaum was the town where Jesus lived. Listen carefully. The town where Jesus lived, although he grew up in Nazareth, the town where he lived was the town of Capernaum. It's actually referred to almost in the scriptures as his headquarters. It's called his own city. 
So the second miracle we know already took place there, but there were many, many miracles taking place there. We have a record of some of them in the Bible. So I was thinking to myself, do you remember the story of the fella who was paralyzed and his friends decided they wanted him healed and they went there and there were so many people that they went up on the roof, tore the roof open and lowered him on the rope. That's the story in Capernaum. Do you remember the story of Peter's wife's mother being very, very sick with a fever? And what happened? It took place at Capernaum. A leper was healed at Capernaum. Two blind men came to the Lord one day and said that they wanted to see. The Bible says Jesus healed them. One man, a deaf mute, was brought to him, and the Lord cast out demons, and the man was healed. Anybody remember the story of Jairus' daughter who had died? Jesus raised her from the dead at Capernaum. So having said all of that, I want you to think with me that the miracle stories are in the Bible because they are true. There are no miracles that are not true. Make sure you understand that when you read your Bible, your Bible always tells the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth about every single thing. It is the true word of God. Having said all that, I want to go on to make mention to you about the fellow that came to Jesus that day, and I want to say a word about the person. I want you to think about the Roman centurion. And the Bible says in verse 5, when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, remember that oftentimes he would leave to go various places. Well, in this case, he had returned to Capernaum. And the the Bible says a centurion came to him, beseeching him, obviously looking for help. If you're looking to somebody to help you, this is what the word beseech means. Now, sometimes it's a good idea to just look at the people that Jesus interacted with. Listen, we have no name. He was a centurion. The centurion was part of the Roman army. I guess I'm always a little bit amazed that we know so little about the Roman army. And the reason is because of the numbers. Lots of people have lots of numbers for the various groups. But the way the army worked was as follows. There was, as far as we know, 33 legions. A legion was made of 6,000 people. A troop had 10 cohorts, and one cohort had six centuries. One century had 80 to 100 men in it. And a centurion was the one who commanded these 80 or 100 men. Now, you probably also have heard of the Praetorian Guard. The Praetorian Guard, they were made up of the ones who were former centurions. They were the best of the best. So when I use the word centurion, I'm not talking about the ordinary soldier, but I am also talking about the important bodyguards, the Praetorian bodyguards. But listen carefully, just a little insight into the Capernaum centurion. We know his importance cannot be overstated, and I mean that the centurion was the commander of men, but the entire army depended upon the centurion. When they went into battle, everything was determined by the centurion. Listen, his main job was to initiate and to enforce rigorous discipline. His soldiers were the low men on the totem pole. But without him and his soldiers, Rome never won any battles because the most important person in the battle was the centurion, not the emperor back in Rome. It was the centurion. He had to have a unit that was completely well-disciplined, well-equipped, well-prepared for battle. And think about it like this. 
This man also had to have a very careful understanding of all the equipment that was needed to go to war. But the centurion understood the power of his own words so that when he said to one of his soldiers, you do this, they did what he said. Now think about that in light of the conversation he's going to have with Jesus here. So I'm telling you that the centurions, that they were crucial to the Roman military machine. They also received high pay. Any idea why? When they went into battle, who went first? The centurion always went first. Now look closely because I want you to notice something there, that the centurion was the man that always wore a specific helmet. He always had this plume or this crest. Now why? Because he was important? Well, you could say that. But his soldiers needed to see him, but who else could see him in battle? So you now you know why that whenever the battle was won, that the centurions always got an excess amount of the, the items that they collected from war? Because they get the danger pay, because they were the first ones into battle. Now I want you to think about this man being a centurion, and he got a problem that particular day, and that particular problem he had today was a friend of his, actually a servant. We don't hear much about the centurions today, but in those days they were easily recognized and they were well known. He was well known in the town of Capernaum. First, miracle stories. Listen, every one of them is true story. You may read a thousand things this week that are not true. You may read 10,000 things that are not true in the next month. When you read a miracle story, when you read the Bible, you know you've got something that is absolutely true. Second, you know something about the Roman centurion. But there's a third thing that I just wanted to say to you about with respect to this matter of the miracles. Even though this guy was the captain, we'll say, the centurion, the man who was very, very important there, I want you to see what the Bible says. The Bible says he came beseeching him. When you've got something going on in your life and you have a need, do you know where to go? What do you do with the things that you have need of and for? The idea of beseeching is you go to somebody who you know can help. You go to that person because you have a need, but you know you have a need, and you know there's a thousand other people in town that you could go see. But this is what this centurion did. The Bible tells us that the people who experienced miracles, think about it, they experienced miracles for a specific reason. But you see what this centurion is doing here? Interestingly enough, folks, he was asking Jesus to perform a miracle on a friend of his. Actually, for somebody else. It was not for himself, obviously. Sick servant, man who was paralyzed. The Bible says that he was tormented by his paralysis. I'm wondering if any of you have prayed for a miracle for anybody else. I know you've got lots of stuff to take care of in your life. You are important. <laughs> There's no two ways about that. God made you. You are very important. But there are other people in your life that when you know that they have a need, you can go to somebody else and beseech them for help and to ask them, even ask him for a miracle. So I don't know what's happening in your life, but I know that there's people around you that you totally love that they are part of you, they are part of your life. They are extremely important to you, and when you see them hurting, what do you do? Have you thought that your place is the place of the centurion who could go to Jesus and ask for a miracle for that person? He's a friend, a friend, a very good friend. 
His servant was now in need, and the centurion is, by the way, the commander of men. He's the strict disciplinarian. You know exactly what he's like, but let me put it like this. Some people suffer because they're in pain, but some people also suffer when other people hurt, and that's the centurion. I'm sure that he had a heart of compassion. I'm looking at him because I want you to think about the Lord responded to this man. And he, he responded in part because this man came to him. He was also quite alert. Now think about it for just a moment when I say he was alert. He recognized an opportunity and the opportunity was a person, and the person's name was Jesus. He had now an opportunity for his friend to be helped. And so I'm thinking that he probably heard, well, maybe he even heard him preach. But he heard about Jesus. He must have heard him been the one. Maybe he'd even seen him in action. I, I don't know. But at least now he saw an opportunity because Jesus was in town and he sprang into action, obviously. Now wouldn't it be wonderful if you were always on the lookout for an opportunity to help somebody? As I said, you've got lots of stuff going on in your life. But don't you think that you should look for those opportunities and when they come up, take them? to be able to help somebody. I'm thinking it would be a wonderful thing if every day of your life you made sure to help one person specifically, having chosen it in your heart and mind that I want to help, and I went ahead and I did it. Now I imagine that probably the centurion knew the difference between a Jew and a Roman. Anybody know the difference? Rome already had twice kicked out every Jew out of the town. The Roman emperor said, Jews out. No Jews allowed in Rome. So you want to remember this when you're thinking about this uh, centurion here. They had been banished now from the city of Rome. So there's not a great, great amount of love between the Romans and the Jews. Yes, they could practice their religion, but they had to pay the temple tax. There were plenty of taxes, by the way, but Today, he wasn't going to the emperor for help. Today, he was going to God the Son. <laughs> now, notwithstanding the relationship between the Jews and the Romans, the centurion was alert. He had been on the lookout for help for his servant, his friend. Now, I want to say something else about him. This man was a man of understanding because of a couple things. One, he understood that Jesus was a healer. Who do you see Jesus as? What do you see him as? Most and many see him as a historical figure, maybe a great teacher. Some people say he's a prophet. But do you see him as he is in the Bible? Do you let him be who he is for you? Think about how great this is. He understood also that Christ could heal somebody just by his spoken word. He could, really? Heal somebody by his spoken word? He saw Jesus certainly as a man of power, but certainly in power of his speech. He understood that when Jesus used the power of his words, something happened. And the Bible says there, Jesus answered him. I will come and heal him. Simple words. I will come and heal. And the Bible says he believed it. But notice the response here. The centurion says, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof. Now, wait a minute. Does not not tell you something about this man? Speak the word only, and my servant will be healed. I'm a man under authority. I have soldiers under me. I say to this guy, go. He goes to another, come. He comes, and my servant do this, and he does that. Every day, his job was to take orders, and every day, his job was to give orders. <laughs> he had to make sure that his soldiers listened. He had to make sure that they obeyed. He had to make sure that they disciplined themselves to be in the kind of force they needed to advance the Roman Empire. Listen, your words are important. I want to say something to you about words. I have to say what I say about words to myself. 
But I want you to say, but I want you to see with me something about what the Bible says about words because words carry power. Your words are important and they are extremely powerful. I was listening to the radio this week, talk radio program of some sort, and this man says, talk has the power to save lives. And I thought, hmm, what exactly he meant by that, I wasn't sure, but I think I know what I mean if I say that talk has the power to save lives. Now, life and death are in the power of the tongue. The scripture says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. The Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 18. There is that speaks like the, watch this, piercings of a sword. Anybody ever been stabbed with a sword? Yes, you have. You have heard and taken words from somebody whose words were like the piercings of a sword. And then, of course, he says that the tongue of the wise brings health to those that hear it. But the piercings of the sword, wow. Here's Jesus on the power of the tongue. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Why do you say what you say? I could say, why do you say how you say what you say? A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. Evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. That's what Jesus said. And here's the Lord's brother. The tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. You ever wonder why the Bible says that? I want to tell you why. You know why it says that? Because you need somebody else to control your tongue. And when you don't let somebody else control your tongue, anything can come out at any time, and it can be extremely hurtful. I've experienced it, and you've experienced it. But haven't you thought about the power of your words? I guess that's one of the things that you can see in the lesson here today. It's easy to forget this because it's easy to say things around you that wound people, that pierce them, that strike deep into somebody's heart. It's easy to damage somebody else with your words. How many of you thought before you spoke this week? You can put your hand up. How many of you thought before you spoke this week? Think before you speak? Really? That's what I have to, that's how a Christian lives before he utters his words. He needs to think. You think maybe God gave you the mind to think so that you would think before you spoke? You can either build the people up around you or what? Tear them down with what? Your speech. One uncontrolled sentence to a little child can damage the child for his entire life. According to the Bible, God's plan is for you and me to submit our speech to him because he is the one who wants to use your speech to build people up and to not tear them down. The unnamed centurion understood the power of words, and maybe you have some understanding, but I want you to think with me about one more idea. The man must have been humble. The man must have had a spirit of humility. The man goes on to say to Jesus, I'm not worthy that you should come to my house. What do you think he thought of Jesus? I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. You see, the best avenue, folks, for him to get help was not complaining about how terrible life was, about how terrible this problem was that his servant had, and blaming and even wishing the guy didn't have paralysis. Instead, he humbly responds to, he responds to the one who had the power of the word, and in humility, the centurion led his servant to health. And I found in the Bible 
And Scripture says that when you humble yourself before God, you get grace. That's what Scripture says. There is another element of the story that you cannot mistake, in, and that is he was a man who exercised simple faith. A man of faith, Jesus goes on to say to the man, the children of the kingdom will be cast into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said to the centurion, go your way as you have believed, so be it done to you. And his servant was held that very same hour. Listen, everybody's got a story. Can you imagine the story he went home to his wife and children with that day? Hun, you are not going to believe this. Well, yes, I do, dear. Look, as you could point to the servant and say, yes, what a story. I think it's a wonderful thing when we think about simple faith. I'm afraid that most of us, myself included, easily fall into complicated faith. <laughs> and the Bible talks about the simplicity of Christ. The simplicity of Christ. When I put my trust in Christ, it's a simple but very, very, very powerful thing. I put my simple faith in the person of Christ and my whole life my life has been miraculously changed because one day I put my faith in the right person. Would you consider the gospel message? The gospel message, of course, it's just so simple. And we want to make it so complicated. The Bible tells us, of course, the facts are that trust is what honors the Lord. Faith is what pleases the Lord. Faith takes God at his word. I want you to think about it like this. When you say you have simple faith, you are saying, I trust God that he'll do whatever he says. Some people come to God and they think they've got to do all this good stuff for God so that God will somehow, what, pat them on the back and tell them that someday you're going to be going into heaven because you did all this good stuff? How complicated is that? How much good would you have to do? At what level would you be able to say, okay, I did enough good things, now I'm definitely in. Except for what the Bible says. By the way, how many sins are one too many? And yet, in simple faith, you'd have all the sins washed away. Simple faith is what pleases the Lord. Simple faith is what honors the Lord. So if you've never put your trust in Christ, you know I am going to say to you again today, here is a prayer that is worth its weight in gold. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I realize that Jesus is, I need Jesus as my Savior. I realize he died for my sins. When he died on the cross, I repent of my sins. I want to be completely forgiven today. And I trust you right now to save me. My confidence is in you alone. I want to be saved today is a simple but golden prayer. But I want to finish up with the opposite, folks. I want to finish up with this idea here. What do you think is going on in the heart of people who don't exercise simple faith. Listen to this. 1 John 5 and verse 10. He that believes not God, watch, 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 has made him a liar because he doesn't believe the record that God gave us of his son. Can you see how powerful that is? That's the opposite of simple faith. You'll call God a liar because you don't believe what God said. So what's it going to be? What is it with you? Is it simple faith? You see, because faith is what he's looking for. Simple faith. Believe what he says is absolutely true and I live according to it. I like it. I love it. I live it. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you so much for free salvation. Thank you, Lord. We don't have to pay. 
We don't even have to exert our effort, Lord. You've given all the effort because you've given us in your love the mighty, wonderful Savior, the Lord Jesus. Father, for that one that's hearing these words today, I pray that, Lord, you'll bring them to simple faith. Lord, get us away from the complicated stuff. We're so busy. We've got so much to do. We've got so much technology. And yet, dear Lord, you want a relationship with us of faith like a little boy, a little girl, a little child. For that one, dear Lord, that today realizes how powerful it is to have simple faith, help them, dear Lord, to say, yes, Lord, I believe what you say over everybody else. I give you the glory, all the praise, all the, all the honor, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen. Beautiful hymn to sing as we go. Number 581. So sweet to trust in Jesus. Listen, folks, if it's not sweet to trust in Jesus, you're trusting in the wrong Jesus. <laughs> so sweet to trust in Jesus. Find with me 581. Please stand with me and let's lift our voices together and say, Tis so sweet to trust. Yes, it's sweet.